brace yourself for something fuel nominal. Unleaded 88 is the clear fuel choice. It's cheaper, cleaner, and greener. And it's grown by Iowa corn farmers. Now that's totally worth the hype. So pump it up with Unleaded 88. Save big money on your next painting project. Menards carries Purdy paintbrushes, roller covers, trays, and paint kits to help you get the job done right. Purdy brushes are handcrafted in the USA and are the number one brand preferred by professionals. Save big on Purdy painting tools at Menards, America's number one home improvement retailer for customer satisfaction according to J.D. Power. For J.D. Power 2024 award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards. Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Hello, Voices of Wrestling listener. Dave Ryan here. Have you ever wondered to yourself, how many hidden gems are hidden away inside the last years of World Championship Wrestling? Have you ever asked yourself how many tenuous gags can be made about the name Mike Enos? And have you ever thought about what it sounds like for two Irishmen to interpret a very chaotic company through its B-show? The answers to all this and more are just a click away. Check out Days of Thunder every second Thursday on the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So Fast to freedom, open the voice gate for august 6 2024 we are members of the voices of wrestling podcast network you can find us on the voices of wrestling podcast network feed or on our own dedicated open the voice gate feed on all podcast platforms and applications you can follow us on twitter at open voice gate if you'd like to donate to us you can click the link in the show notes it'll take you to our red circle.com landing site you click the red box that says sponsor this podcast and you can set up a reoccurring or one-time donation no obligation whatsoever but we would like to thank all of our previous donors i'm one of your hosts it's your old pal mike spears join alongside as always case low and case i have to ask you uh, this morning, I know I was really on the mend watching my track cycling, but did you catch any important Twitter spaces this morning? I did not. I have a lot to say about the Olympics and not a lot to say about Twitter spaces, but what's up with, uh, with the Twitter space universe? Oh, uh, the, the most important man in Dragon Gate right now, Manny Skywalker allegedly hosted a Twitter space this morning. I love that. He's a go-getter. That's why Shun Skywalker likes him. Yeah, uh, uh, apparently, uh, allegedly, it was uh, Skywalker impersonating him. I love this. I, yeah. I love this. More, more on Minorita and Skywalker in a second. You really jumped right in this week. I've got, I've got Olympics to talk about. All right. So uh, uh, well, we have to talk about the sport that's taken over the world, and that's kayak cross. Okay. Aware of it. Have not seen any of it yet. Okay. So four people races. They have like a drop down shoot that they drop them like three meters into the water on their kayaks. Like they slide down into it. And then it's basically a solemn course that they also have to do barrels underwater. in. So I love four, it. four kayaks doing this at the same time. Is this a new sport this year? Yes, it is. Okay. I've got a, I've got a semi new sport recommendation. I, I watched something over the weekend. It debuted in 2021 but I didn't watch any of it. So what I was watching, I was I was unaware of its existence until it was on TV. 
and I couldn't believe what was happening as long as it went on. And I have a full five star recommendation for you. Did you catch any of Team Judo? No, but I did watch the heavyweight finals. Okay, so I did. I, I did know that Team France like was like the the, the big highlight there because I'm, I'm blanking on the guy's name, Teddy. Yeah, I can't think of his name. But Reiner. The, 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 yeah, yeah, Reiner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they have like the. But they have like a wheel choosing what matchup has to happen. So yes, so I watched the bronze medal match on Saturday when it was happening, and then I I had to go about my day on Saturday, and I I've got everything DVR'd on YouTube TV. So Sunday morning, I went back and watched the gold medal match. So Team Judo, there's six weight classes. Uh, for lack you know for to the the simple way of looking at it is it's like men's middleweight. Women's bantamweight, men's heavyweight, women's flyweight, men's light heavyweight, uh, women's, you know, whatever. There's there's three male weight classes, three female weight classes, and they trade off. So it's a little bit like a cybernetico match where there's a batting order. Uh, the order stays the same throughout. They never go like heavyweight man against like flyweight woman, which would be its own interesting thing. But it's one through six. It's a best of six series. And... I feel comfortable spoiling this because it won't hurt the enjoyment if you go back and, and rewatch it. But both the bronze, which was, I think, Brazil and Korea, and then the gold, which was Japan and France, both ended in a tie. They finished 3-3. Three, three, and that is when they go to the, the Jumbotron, like it's spin the wheel, make the deal, and they they roll a weight class onto the Jumbotron, and whatever that weight class is, those people fight it out for the gold in like a sudden death match. Mike, it's unbelievable how entertaining this is. Cause I like judo anyways. It's, you know, outside of basketball, it's my go-to sport during the Olympics. I really, really enjoy it. This goes to show this made me hate wrestling. Cause it goes to show how unimaginative, especially American wrestling is. This was closer to uh, like a dragon gate stipulation that it was, you know, like core Olympic level sport. I'm right now looking at the scorecards and it is like, it, it is like fascinating where like you see like that uh, Brazil, Italy one where it's like, okay, we go to the wheel and it's going to be women flyweight. Go. Yeah, exactly. And then and, the, the, the men's one or the, the gold medal. Again, I think this is a worthy spoiler. I hope this convinces people to watch it rather than stay away. It's the heavyweights. It's the man is the male heavyweights. So yeah. the, the French guy who we were just talking about goes up against Japan's heavyweight and it's I, it, it's unbelievable. It is without a doubt. It is my new favorite sport in the entire Olympics. I I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it. It made me hate wrestling because we're not doing this. I don't understand how wrestling isn't doing this. I don't understand how anybody in wrestling isn't seeing that and immediately taking it and putting it on their TV or putting it in Corkin or putting it in Nagoya or putting it in Osaka. What a phenomenal gimmick it is. Yeah, it kind of reminds me, and um, this is just a different framework. I'm forgetting what the uh, ladies pro wrestling versus all Japan women four on four match that happened oh, at Tokyo. Oh yeah, Day, yeah, yeah. That they completely it was like, all right, we're gonna do uh, four five minute periods, and then after that, then we're gonna open it up from it being like singles matches, and then being like the tag match, and it's just like. Those are the things that, at least for me, I feel like it's like whenever you're playing within the system and finding something completely different. If it's a spin a deal, make it uh, spin the deal, make the match, or if it is something like that. The the, the it, here's an analog here case. Uh, my favorite part on uh, Olympic track cycling, which is my favorite thing to watch at the Olympics, isn't the team pursuit or team sprint. Where team sprint, I mean, they get up to like. 60 kilometers an hour and uh, for pursuit you're doing basically four kilometers in about three minutes and 40 seconds on this track and you have to like keep in it and with this the, the most interesting ones to me are the optimums and the madison races because at least for the optimum it's four different races in one so you get to have a little bit of everything whereas with the madison was the one i think i've i've talked to you about where it's like they have kind of like rankings and you tag in and you tag out within the race okay, it's the most yeah. fascinating stuff possible and it's just like taking the established idea if it's being judo with like the wheel or within 
track cycling with like, okay, we have to go around this track somehow. And just going like, what can we do to make it different? And it creates completely compelling, different, completely compelling sport out of anything. And if, and if pro wrestling could get their act together in a lot of ways and learn some things about this, I mean, man, to just imagine like what stuff you could be doing with like the idea of a cybernetico or a gauntlet. I know, I know, you know, the, the, the last American innovation match we had was the elimination chamber. And I, I fear that, I guess maybe ultimate X, I don't know which one came first. I guess they were around the same time, but that's not, that's not what I'm looking for. You know, that's, that's more gimmick based into this sport based and Championship I, scramble, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I, yeah, I, I don't know. It just, I, I, I look at stuff like this, and you're right that that Joshi uh, four on four match, which I watched when you and Alan and I were doing Greatest Stress Forever a few years ago. Like that's a great comp. There's just, there, there's nothing like that. And uh, I guess we can segue into this because I had a conversation with Tony Khan today, which I'll talk about in just a second. But like, I guess in my heart of hearts, that's what I was hoping AEW was going to be when it started was a mix of Crockett and then a mix of like really sporty, almost like evolve on steroids level pro wrestling. And it wasn't ever that, and it's certainly not going to be that now, uh, which is a bummer because I still think there's a giant hole in the market for stuff like that. But I did have a conversation with Tony Khan today. Uh, how uh, AWPR reached out to me and said, do you want to talk to Tony Khan? And I said, yeah, of course I do. And so we had about a half hour conversation that should, unless this podcast goes up in the very middle of the night, that should be out uh, by the time most people hear this, I will link it on my social media. I'll put it in the AEW channel on the Voices of Wrestling Discord as well, so people can check that out. It's, you know, Tony doing media rounds. It's not the juiciest thing you've ever heard, but there are some interesting hologram notes in terms of just the the vision that he has for hologram. There's some clarification on who is quote unquote in the room when it comes to the AEW creative process. And there's an update on the status of strong hearts, because of course there is, because I talked to Tony Khan, there's an update on the status <laughs> of strong hearts and AEW at the very end of that interview. So uh, thank you to my shoot job because they were interested in talking to me because of the platform that my shoot job has, and it worked out quite nicely. Tony was a delightful human. Yeah. I can't wait to hear what he has to say about strong hearts. I, I, I wonder what his takes are on modern glaze to be oh, honest. Yeah, well, that's, you know, I, I was telling this, you know, to you off the air, but the, the one thing I didn't get into was what his level of consumption is of wrestling outside of AEW at this point. Cause I would imagine it's next to none, but it's also Tony Khan. So, so who knows, but well, a, a lot of plane flights. I mean, he was in Paris. That's right. That's right. No, you'll, d during this interview, you'll hear a lot of Oh man, that's a great question. That's a great question. And then great he'll question. Yep. And then he'll kind of answer what I ask him. And then he'll plug Tony Storm or MJF or Brian Danielson. And I respect it. He he was he was so kind. Uh, and he is a master of answering questions while not answering them. I mean, I it, it one of the things about AEW is I feel like five years ago they would have put like the rock and rolls out there tomorrow and you've been like great question I I I I think that it it's very interesting how uh Mini Skywalker has come about but uh, but but boy do we have a great show for coming to you tomorrow from the uh, Lawrence Jewel uh, Memorial Coliseum in Winston Salem, North Carolina. Well, that was one of the great strengths of AEW at the beginning was it felt like they really respected wrestling history. And oh, I remember, I, I remember tweeting this once where I, I, I forget, it might've been, it might've been something with the rock and rolls. I don't know, but I just remember they did some sort of segment with some sort of old guy. And I was like, man, this is really nice and nice things don't happen in wrestling a lot. And you think about, you know, WWE at this point has just completely abandoned anybody that isn't totally in their canon, but you go back 20 years and they would have, you know, a Bachwinkle at ringside for a pay-per-view or something. And it was, it was just small. And, you know, you hear stories about Kevin Dunn complaining about it. You know, Kevin Dunn, when they ran a uh, pay-per-view in St. Louis and they rolled out some old NWA guys, you know, him complaining about how nobody knows who these guys are and nobody gives a shit and this, that, and the other thing. And you felt like it, it was like, Oh no, they're, they're the bridge. You know, they're, they're really helping these old guys have one last nice moment before they head off into the sunset. And we don't really get that anymore. Yeah, Humpty Wheeler, people like that. Yeah. I feel like we're we're always like a presence in at least for like when I would go to shows up in Charlotte when they ran the Bojangles Coliseum, they always kind of made a deal about being in Charlotte and at that venue for that. And, and they run some of the old Crockett places and they always have, which is one of those things that like 
I, I, I know everyone's entranced by the video game stadium right now, but like, uh, the, the, when you're doing like Crockett territory, you're like, oh, you're almost right next to the Spartanburg, uh, war memorial where they used to tape it. And I, 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 there's a certain part of me that's like, oh, I kind of wish that they would go and they would run some of those venues like that, like the Bojangles and do have those like Crockett kind of vibes because at one time they really did have that and i feel like in 2021 when they came back from uh daily's place they kind of lost that a little bit but they developed that the other aura at least there for a couple of years it felt well yeah like i mean like, you know they they lost the cody verse and at one point i was i was perhaps cody's biggest critic and even into AEW, you know that's before AEW, but even into AEW, I, I you know i i, I always sort of side-eyed cody i i really did not trust him or his decision making or his vision a, a, a ton but there is a, a level of authenticity that that he brought to AEW that I do that I do greatly miss and I I sadly you know I, I wish that the other side of the coin was people to come full circle here that were like really into sports based pro wrestling and not attitude era but you know what can you do yeah like that's the the big wonder about the sports based uh, idea was how much that really could have done if they actually really embraced it, you know, because no one really, uh, uh, other than like the chase, I feel like, and, and even then, like we're talking so far back, like that has not been something that necessarily has been like applied to like mass pro wrestling. I I guess. You could say the impact box and what they did with Fox Sports and with that. But that was, in a way, I I feel like still at a smaller scale. Yeah. Oh, completely. Like we never got to see what the true sports based thing. I mean, the rankings were worked and were a joke from the start. Like that was like the one kind of play for that. And that's. I I mean it is what it is, but well, and I, I, and I was into the rankings more more than most because I always looked at it as it was just like college football. You know, there wasn't there wasn't a rhyme or reason for some of those things, and that's what made it intriguing. And unfortunately, uh, the grifters got their way. Man, unfortunately, sometimes that that that's the way it goes. It, it is. I I just I don't know. I sometimes I think back. Like lately, I've been thinking about like peak evolve. And then it's just like, oh man, that was so so easy to watch and so simple. And you know, Gabe would try to do angles and they wouldn't work, but there was an overall theme to the promotion that everybody agreed on, and it was a little the like Dragon Gate. Yeah, yeah, yes, the gatekeepers. What's what's Jaka doing? Is that guy still wrestling? I think Jaka might be fully gone now. I know he like made like a like a brief like COVID reappearance in some places. Let me but... let me pop up his cage match here real quick. Yeah, he wrestled. Yeah, yeah in may of this year in Boy. florida teaming yeah, I know with he moved sean to Orlando. Maluda. yeah teaming with sean maluda interesting um yeah okay he just does florida indies that's a shame that guy's really good yeah he was always so much like i jocko was the kind of jocko was on elevation three years ago that's crazy because i mean he was doing the he was doing the tag team with dickinson and yeah even even before Dickinson was was who we thought he was. I just that was never never my guy. I always thought he was a corny pro wrestler. But if you go back and look at Jaka's 2017, it's a it's a singles match with ACH. It's a singles match with Yehai, who I I greatly miss, even despite some of his questionable personality traits. It was the evolved title match with Zack Saber Jr., which was super good. He had another match with Zack Saber Jr. that was super good. Like this guy was a great pro wrestler in the year 2017. He had three matches with Zack in 2017. I don't remember that. Holy cow. I got I gotta find some of this WWN like flow slam era evolve. I haven't run across it in a while. And I I just imagined it would be like comfort food. I really like to revisit some of this. I, I think the th- the thing that kind of like got me uh, at least as it is towards him, it, as I'm like looking at this, is like, oh, basically like that was it for him, and then he he went away. Yeah. Because like, he wasn't like a big indie guy before that he was like a beyond wrestling right. and yeah. chikara guy but wasn't ever he wasn't the face of chikara he wasn't the face of beyond like gabe actually stumbled into something with him and really really made something of him right and it was always felt like that jaka at least out of the overall like team pazuzu like like what have you like 
out, out of everything at that time in 2017, it felt like he was the one that was like most ready to go, right? Like I was like, oh, Jaka like has the ability and yeah, I has the charisma and everything. Like he, well, well, like if you were to start AEW two years before, like I feel like Jaka would be someone you would put on your watch list for that. Easily. Yeah, because he had a good look too. Right. Yeah. For wow. Sure. Evolve seventy seven. Let me let me run through this card before we talk about Dragon Gate. Uh, opening tag match, six man tag: Barrett Brown, Darby Allen, and Zack Saber Jr. versus Ethan Page and the Gatekeepers. I remember that because Darby jumped like did a coffin drop off of a pole. Uh, Tracy Williams versus Laredo Kid, Chris Dickinson and Jaka versus Jason Kincaid and Sammy Guevara. ACH versus Fred Yehi. Matt Riddle versus all caps Dustin in a no DQ match that kicked that match ass. rule. Yes, that, that match, match rule. kicked yeah. ass. Uh, Timothy Thatcher versus Jeff Cobb, which I remember being horrible. And then Zack Sabre Jr. versus Chris Hero and Hero's indie send off. Yeah, that was the night after the ring broke on Casa. Oh, yeah, that's right. And that was oddly enough against Jaka. Right. Yeah. Whoa. Wow. I forgot that that was that weekend. Mm hmm. Did Casa ever wrestle again? No, we did not. No, of all 76. Was... That was it. Yeah. Yeah, he's now, last time I heard, a firefighter in Charleston. Yeah, seemed to be living a very happy life free of Gabe Sapolsky the last time I checked. Yeah, and seemed to, like, not have, like, a, like, like long-term health concerns, you know, considering. Yeah, well, I mean, he, you know, I, every day Sal should wake up and thank God that Peter Casa didn't sue him. I I mean, that ring, just, just like, the, the way that it was versus the Keith Lee and uh, Chris Hero match, that was just, who boy. Embarrassing. Also, I'm now looking at Casa's Wikipedia, and I forgot that, or his cage match, and I forgot that at one point he was in a tag team called Nuclear Casa Roll. Yep, uh, with Chase Cauliflower Brown. Five stars. Yeah. That is, where where is that in modern wrestling? Where is the nuclear casserole of our time? It doesn't exist. I, I, I mean, like, Chase Brown, I remember being a Carolina's, like, indie jobber who had, like, an awful look and that kind of work he always brought. brought cauliflower of him. Like, he had, like, a, ring, a very short Ring of Honor tenure. I, I love that. Do you remember Alabama Attitude? Alabama Attitude. Is that something? Was that, like, an... Hey, I'm blanking on his name now. Uh, small guy from Adam. What's his name? Priest. Is that Adam Priest? Tag team. Well, uh, it was. Hold on, I just lost. It was Corey Hollis. Was the okay. guy that I always remember. It was Corey Hollis and Mike Posey, and they were like a Southern indie tag team that didn't really do Southern indies. Whenever Ring of Honor, like Sinclair era Ring of Honor, would run the South, they would yeah. always use them. They were a big PWX tag team, which was that indie promotion that High oh, Spots I, ran. I, yeah, yeah, outside of Charlotte. I know PWX yeah. pretty intimate. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. always thought they were going to break out. They were just kind of, you know, they were almost like a wrong place, wrong time. Because that's a team you could put on TV as Jobber to the Stars type guys. Right. And I think they would kill it, but there wasn't really the environment for that at the time. And so they just never, they never went anywhere because Ring of Honor never pushed them. And they never really got a shot and Evolve. And PWX waned in relevancy. But, yeah. you know, a Hollis decade... came yeah. around a decade early to be a Carolina's wrestler, I yes. felt like. And, and you know, I, I remember this team. I mean, this is an undercard Ring of Honor tag team from a decade ago. And I still think mm, those guys should have been a bigger deal. Yeah, I also remember Hollis and Skyler. John Skyler. Yeah, 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 yeah. That. Yeah, like those were the parts of the Carolina Indies that people should have really glommed on to, not like CWF and Mid Atlantic. <laughs> you know, I was going to bring that up if we well, were going this direction. It's funny. I saw uh, a friend of the show, Chad Campbell, tweeting about CWF Mid Atlantic a few days ago, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that uh, that did exist, didn't it?" Like we all. It was five minutes away from me when I went to undergrad. Yeah, we Never all bothered. we all watched a, an a, a, a one hundred minute Trevor Lee match, didn't we? We all fell for it. Some of y'all did. I fell asleep ten minutes in. <laughs> there's, it was there's the last wrestling match that actually put me to sleep, guys. Actually oh. put me to sleep. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't blame you. It was not. It was not something. I mean, look, I watched it. I was into it because at that point I had all the time in the world to watch everything, but. The way some people talked about that, I, it's just it's hard to explain if you weren't there. This this indie promotion that was selling a hundred tickets a show for some people had this gravitational pull that is just impossible to explain. 
Yeah, and I, I, I think really what needs to be learned and taken from it was, okay, they were on Twitch for free. And they were the first ones to really kind of do that. Oh, so I see. I don't even remember that. That's funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember them always being, like, freely accessible. And that's when I was kind of going, like, oh, I always kind of raise my eyebrow about uh, when people really pimp those kinds of promotions. It started with me of CWF Mid-Atlantic going, oh, they're liars. They're liars. <laughs> All righty. Do you want to talk about Minorita Mike? Yes. Oh, or, or I mean, Hayakawa. That's me. right. That's right. Takumi the, Hayakawa, Mini Skywalker. Mini Skywalker. So big story coming out of this last week. Uh, for, for the remainder of the program, uh, we'll talk about the Corquin from August 1st as well. Coming up on Monday, Dangerous Gate in Yokohama Budokan. But it, it, in the way that things kind of do, we all had our eyebrow raised uh, when this match was made. Uh, even before Kobe World, Kota Minora versus uh, Minorita uh, for this August 8th cork. And Minorita versus Kota Minora. Kota Minora pens Minorita after about 10 minutes with a golden rose. It was not a easy win for Minora, but not necessarily one where Rita was actually in it w w was pulling the momentum on his side. But really the news from this match was the post match as Z Bratz came out and uh with a Skywalker match mask, they knocked away all of Gold Class. They abducted uh Minorita in the middle of the ring, put on the Skywalker mask and he became mini Skywalker. They almost managed to get him back to gold class, but by the end of the segment and into like, into like right now, as we were talking about uh, Twitter spaces earlier, uh, Manorita is no more. He has been replaced by mini Skywalker. And after the main event of uh, the show on the first, we had announced an all out war uh, for Dangerous Gate, Minorita contra Mini Skywalker, Gold Class versus Zebrats, Kota Minora, Benkei, BB Hulk, Mochizuki Jr. versus Skywalker, Kai, Ishin, and Jason Lee. If all of that sounded bad, it wasn't. It was highly entertaining. It was vintage Dragon Gate. And I think we've now been presented with our with a match at Dangerous Gate that could really go in either direction. And I want to kind of run through the possible scenarios we have here, but I'm curious just heading into this show, which we'll do a full preview of at the end of this episode. We obviously have plenty more from Cork and Hall to talk about, even if it wasn't the most noteworthy Cork and Hall show in history. But Mike, where do you want this to go? Because there's a million different avenues. What is your hope coming out of Dangerous Gate? I think um, Mini Skywalker, he should play in that space for a little bit before whatever he will be coming out of it. It's it, it, it it's a situation of Hayakawa that like we've seen how great he has been and at least is playing Minori uh, playing Minora's mascot, doing Skywalker's mascot as like this uh the, the, this uh going for the custody of this mascot character i think it's great i love it actually I, I i i do think that what i really want to see is to just like a couple month run like into whatever because look uh you have jason lee and you have and you have shun skywalker they've been wearing purple all the time we're getting a refresh or a rebrand or something i want to see mini skywalker go into that for a couple months before you know he breaks free and does his next thing yeah, I'm with you. I, I think that's where the – well, I, I guess I, I shouldn't say I'm with you. I, I hear you. I I am still – I'm at a point now where I'm fighting against, I guess, Japanese pr tradition where you turn some people heel so that you can cheer them later on. And I, I have certain reservations that we can get into with this match because I'm at a point now where I really want to cheer for Minorita – and in a related note, I really want to cheer for Mochizuki Jr. And I'm afraid that we could leave Dangerous Gate with one of those men as a heel, if not both of those men as a heel. And I'm not really interested in that right now. These are two guys that, you know, speaking from a pure fan lens, have really earned my respect. I, I think they've developed a phenomenal repu reputation. 
And for as entertaining as Mini Skywalker is, and I'm not saying that we have to abandon this completely, uh, because there's obviously great fun to be had with the mini bodysuit and the mini mask and, you know, mini Skywalker moves. I, I get it. I like that idea. But I hope sooner rather than later we're, we're cheering for Takumi Hayakawa and not Mini Skywalker. I did not really come out of this expecting a junior heel turn. Well, well, well what led you to think well, that? Well, okay, so, so let me so let me go through the possible scenarios here of what okay. we could get. I, I ranked these in terms of what I would like to see the most compared to what I would like to see the least. Junior is at the tail end of this, so if Junior feels out of place now, I will explain as we get there. What I want to see the most, and this is coming out of Dangerous Gate, whether it happens at that show specifically or maybe the September Corkin, I don't know, but. What I would like to see the most is still a Coach Minora heel turn and a Minorita face turn, because I'm going to note Minorita as a heel going forward. So Coach Minora turns heel, Minorita turns face. I still think that is the most interesting option of any of these. You also have the option of Coach Minora turning heel and Minorita staying heel, and both of those guys being in the, the heel unit, whether it's Zebrats or something else, is yet to be seen. I think that would be very interesting. A Minora face turn and a Minorita heel turn. So I guess at this point, they're they're staying where they are now. I don't love that. I don't think, and I'll have you weigh in here, I don't think the character of Kota Minora as it stands today is strong enough to stand on its own without the aided help and the aided charisma of Minorita. And I think Dragon Gate might be thinking, okay, we're really going to turn the dial up on Minora. This is going to be his run. He can't have a goofy sidekick. I think that is ill thought out. I think Minorita is still the stronger of the two in that pairing. And I think there's a real chance Minora could fall flat on his face if he stays as a baby face and Minorita stays as a heel. Yeah, I. It, 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 if it's a status quo that happens and especially if it's Kota Minora just going like well I lost Minorita now I guess I'm back to normal I don't feel like that that's earned whatsoever and I don't feel like that that will be enough of a change really to progress him into that next stage because like what well what has he learned out of this or like what has he grown from when as he's gone through this a uh, rookie kind of de-elevation, you know, like doing the openers. This match was match three, which was a big point of kind of contention for Minorita. But I, I, I feel like if you kind of keep it status quo, other than okay, you get to see like it. The mini Skywalker solves a big problem with the heel unit. It does, but keeping Kota Minora as is, I just the. Well, we still need that change and we still need something about him to change if it is the heel turn or some sort of character change because if we keep on the same path i don't i i, I mean at a certain point like you're just kind of r- running a- up against a wall a brick wall the brick wall is going to win out and that nothing's going to change if you keep on running up against the brick wall the same way right which le- yeah exactly which leads me to what i think is the least desirable of any of the scenarios which is that everything goes back to normal here and that hayakawa comes out back as minorita or even as takumi hayakawa but just in gold class he he shakes from the spell of shun skywalker but then kota minora also stays in gold class i, I know it is uh, natural for us to lean towards saying shake it up move some things around unit displacement But this now feels like a really strong demarcation point where you can't return to what was and that whether it is, again, Minorita staying heel, whether it is Minora turning heel, which I still think is the most interesting option, you can't just do this angle and then wipe your hands of it. In September, we have Hulk and Minora and Minorita in an opening trios match. You know, that's not going to be any good. And I could see them also doing that, which, again, I think is the, the most boring of any routes possible. And it, it could lead to, you know, more uh, more catastrophe with Coach Minora. I'm not sure that I trust him as the as a uh, as just a bland babyface, which is what he is right now. And it, is he actually a babyface though? In this character, like he's dropped all of the fan service pretense. He never has been known as the most charismatic guy. Like he's just kind of just neutral. I would say. 
He's neutral, but I he's directly opposed against the obvious heel unit. So he's yeah, he's a yeah, de facto he, baby face, but that doesn't mean that he's a good one. Right. Yeah, that that's fair. That's fair. I guess like for me and like with this angle and with the crowd response, the crowd was into the entire portion of it, especially like to the point of uh gold class almost escapes to the back and then zebrats attacks them and and the crowd starts shrieking you can't go back on that kind of emotion because that's when you get into uh when you betray a fan base in a way i feel like because there was general and like screams and wails when oh, zebrats yeah. pulled them away like you can't the the status quo is not a return state because like you've kind of crossed that rubicon at least at with the characters like there has to be some sort of differentiation this was a great angle this was the kind of thing that you know if you're drawing it you can you can put your hand hands on the back of your head and look at any other promotion in the world and go all right you guys do this because anywhere else it would be completely absurd and you know i think for people on the level of fandom that you and i are you know this is certainly what i gravitate to is not drawing it being good for the sake of being good but Drangate being good in a way that only they can. And this is certainly them being good in only a way that they can. This was a great angle. I- I'm concerned about the follow-up because I think there's such a high ceiling, but I also think there's such a low floor. And normally I would give the promotion the benefit of the doubt and trust, you know, whatever the next step is, but it involves Coach Minora. And that, as we have learned, that is a dangerous game and it is really impossible to tell where they're going to go from here. Right, and I, I, I think it's worth noting that coming out of this Quin, we do have the full card. We'll talk about that there. You, you put together two championship matches that have outsiders involved, and having outsiders that I would say probably, by and large, are not appealing to the, the people that would buy into the single as much. You know, so in, in a way, like you, you, you have some vegetables you had to eat because you're in Yokohama and you're like, OK, we're going to bring in Junta Milwaukee and Kirishio, to- Tokyo, Japan. You don't like that. But hey, you're getting an all out war in this angle happening for you guys, for, for like the true believers. It's all right. We, we're doing this, too, to take care of y'all. And I think that that was a pretty smart and a little bit of a death maneuver of booking to do that on the same show. That's an interesting point. I, I hadn't really thought about that. You know, the outsiders, the Juta thing, I, I don't read into too much. I, I in, Until I hear otherwise, I'm fully of the belief that the Juta thing is a rare instance of Ultimo calling a shot and showing loyalty to a guy that was very loyal to him in Mexico. And I think this is, you know, whether you want to believe it's, this is what they get for Monte doing the N1. Or again, I think it's just Ultimo saying, hey, you know who we should give a shot to? Junta Milwaukee. He looked good on that Bouyadin show. I don't know what it is. That one doesn't phase me. The Giro thing is a little peculiar. And as, you know, somebody as locked in as I am, I don't necessarily want to see that in my Dragon Gate. So you're right. This is a, a fine substitute. I'm going to sit through a Twin Gate match that might be a level below what it should be, but at least I get this. Yeah, and at least, like, in, 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 a, in a way to touch on Dangerous Gate for a second, I get why you bring in Jiro. Like, or at the very least, being like, maybe he brings, like, the people in there for it in that way. I just, it, 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 the show needed to have a match like this put on and a angle to set up a match like this, I felt like, for this Quirk win, because... I mean, my written review up on Voices of Wrestling, it it, it was a fun show. I, I, I'll say that. And a lot of my enjoyment of that comes out of this angle, which I felt like was one of those Dragon Gate angles, as you said. Like, it's you well, you watch Dragon Gate to watch the things that only Dragon Gate could. Yeah. You know, one of the other things that I think is worth noting just before we move on, and actually it can sort of dovetail into the main event of this show, is Zebrats are back cooking in a real way. and we've gone through some time periods where you know you've had injuries and excursions that have hurt the numbers of of bodies in this unit and you obviously still have Kato out and Valletta you know TBD on if he'll return or not I really hope so I'd like to see him for at least one more tour but think about how interesting it is you have this main event in Corkin against D Courage you have this gold class match 
uh, at Dangerous Gate that has an actual build to it and feels really hot. feels like the hottest thing on the show because it's the thing they could build most to on this cork. And you couldn't do a ton with Yamato and Kakuta. They did a ton with Zebrats and Gold Class here. You have the ongoing issue of Zebrats and Natural Vibes. I'm sure at some point the issue between Zebrats and Big Hug is going to heat up. And then you have Zebrats and Paradox, who, who don't really feel like they're existing in the same universe right now. But Zebrats have become such a strong heel unit again because they've sort of ebbed and flowed throughout their two and a half year existence at this point that any Zebrats main event that has any sort of uh, gross word to use in the in the context of contemporary wrestling, but any Zebrats main event that has a story built into it is going to feel really hot because whether it's Ishin or Jason or Shun or perhaps even Mini Skywalker, like this unit is really clicking right now. This unit is doing really good things. And I just think that's worth noting, especially in the context of talking about what's to come with Gold Class, but now also talking about what they did with D-Courage. Yeah, and I think with Zebrats, and and especially as like it relates to like this main event, and the idea of Zebrats being such a now like a heavy presence on the show, when they have that core four in a match together, it, it raises the stakes. Well, like because you always would, at least for the last few months, you had Kai and Ishin off on their own kind of thing, and yet Shun and Jason do their thing. So the fact that you have all four of them both here in this Corquin main event against D-Courage and Ryusuke Taguchi, as well as that's the Zebrats match at Dangerous Gate. I think it just, like, it pulls focus and kind of, in a way, in a way kind of raises the stakes because they're all there. And I feel like that there is something about a heel unit that when it is on all cylinders, like, you think I saw across my timeline, like, a Kayentai Deluxe, uh match from michinoku pro and it's like oh yeah it's all 10 of them like you have to if you have the entire kai and tai deluxe including shiryu and Menteo. but if you have all of them together it changes it and i feel like that that was something that really adds to the stakes and i think that that was an aspect of zebrats we got to see in this main event with zebrats versus d courage uh, madoka kakuda dragon daya ryu ryo yatanaka with the pinch hitting Ryusuke Taguchi of New Japan Pro Wrestling, Zebrats wins a surprisingly clean affair, a scrap buster Jinchu on Tanaka from Ishin to get the win in about 20 minutes. Uh, but we had Taguchi kind of come and play, but really, a- as you were saying, Case, this was a Zebrats match more so than anything. Yeah, yeah, I wanted this to be better than it was. I I had an idea of Taguchi in my head that just didn't come into fruition. A a more serious Taguchi, not that I was expecting him to be Toshiaki Kawada, but I thought he would have assimilated just a little bit better into this environment than he did. It was a good match. You know, I I have seen many a Taguchi matches throughout my years that have been train wrecks, you know, that have not landed uh, with what they're going for. The concept is a failure, the failure, the execution is a failure. This was not that. This was a perfectly fine match. It was a step down from your usual Dragon Gate Corkin and a major step down from uh, what would have been had Yoshioka been in this match. I get it. Uh, it certainly felt big. I don't know. To, uh, to you, did Taguchi come across like a big star? Because he did to me. Yeah, enough so that I almost pulled up YouTube to play his theme music as he came <laughs> out. Just because, like, I was like, "Oh, the crowd's actually really into it," and that I, I and that was a thing that kind of sucked on the show was losing that ability to kind of read off of that. But I, I as I wrote, like, this was collectively like like if we put our brains together, case this is what we were going to get. <laughs> like, I a, a whole lot. Uh, Madoka Kakuta Fezation, you know, and Taguchi, and then you know, is going to end with uh, uh, Ishin, the kind of the the heel that's getting a little bit of a push, pending the rookie, you know. But it just never really got out of just doing exactly what you expected it to be. No, I thought the star of the match was Tanaka, which I guess is becoming a reoccurring theme. He's kind of becoming a super worker in Cork, and when he's given the chance and. You know, I, I, I don't know if I had to take somebody's year, would I rather have Daya's year, Super Juniors included, or Tanaka's year? I've been far more entertained by Tanaka this year. And that's not really a slight on Daya because I think he's been good, but Tanaka's Tanaka's a thrilling wrestler. And I, I still think 
even within the bubble that we exist in, you know, he's he's heavily underrated. And I'm hoping he turns heads at Dangerous Gate. And a, as we head into Dangerous Gate, where fingers crossed, we get a King of Gate lineup and announcement. I'm really hoping Tanaka's in King of Gate. You know, if it's single elimination, he'll be bounced in the first round, whatever. But if it's block play, he could have a chance for four or five really, really interesting matches. And I think he's ready. He's not ready to win. He's not ready to be pushed. But I think he's ready to have great matches with just about anybody on the roster. Brace yourself for something fuel nominal. Unleaded 88 is the clear fuel choice. It's cheaper, cleaner, and greener. And it's grown by Iowa corn farmers. Now that's totally worth the hype. So pump it up with Unleaded 88. Save big on all your back-to-school needs. All in the Baker's app. Get tender USDA choice untrimmed beef brisket for $2.99 per pound, limit two. Then get 10 for $10 during our sale on items like Lay stacks, rice a and sparkling ice sparkling water, all with your card. Shop these deals at your local Bakers, less than 10 miles away, or tap the screen now to download the Bakers app to save big today. Bakers, fresh for everyone. Prices and product availability subject to change. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Yeah, and I feel like a match like this really kind of puts the focus onto him because you were going to have to have him kind of eat a whole lot of stuff uh, of offense and really it, it, it do the work here. And he, he's getting a payoff for that almost immediately. I mean, he's facing KZ at dangerous gate, as you kind of alluded to, that's going to be a, a big highlight for him. I just think that for D courage right now, bringing in to Gucci and having this kind of be the payoff of everything. It kind of, worked out in a way where like we're still not a definite date back for Yuki Yoshioka but probably sometime this fall we'll be getting news that he is returning or more more likely than not him being like a shock return or like getting into the ring and saying like all right and I'm back basically and I feel like that it kind of in, in a way that the, this entire best of the super junior experience for Daya it, uh, coinciding with Tanaka kind of crystallizing into form you, you it, I guess in a wild way, Decourage feels a little bit more relevant and maybe more hot than they have since. I mean, I, I, I feel like that the maybe since that they were Twin Gate champions last year, maybe. Like maybe. Feels- I, I, I don't know. It, it, the, the problem with them is that even if they're more relevant, they're still the least relevant unit in the company because I think vibes on a whole is just more consistent, more entertaining than they are. Paradox. I'm morbidly intrigued by way more so when Doi's around, but even when Doi's not, you know, I, I, as we discussed heavily last week, I'm, I'm into the Yamato right now. I'm into what he's doing. I just said what I said about Zebrats. In gold class, you have this great mystery up in the air. So the problem with, with D-Courage is, again, it's, it's nothing specifically that they're doing. It's that the competition against them is just so strong. And, and so that's why... Uh, you know, I think the the Kakuta Yamato match doesn't feel as hot as it could. Now, again, you're also again dealing with issues with build there. It's why Daya maybe isn't as exciting as uh, he he seems to be this year than in the years previous, where I've been way higher on him as an overall wrestler than I am this year. Uh, but it's why Tanaka continues to jump out at me because because Tanaka is still new and exciting. He's been in this unit less than a year, and the rest of D Courage. It's good. It's good, but we know it's good. We, and we know what they are. And I, I think Big Hug has replaced them in the pecking order. I think Big Hug is currently doing D-Courage better than D-Courage is doing D-Courage. And I'm kind of hoping for all of these guys that there's a pivot soon, even though it seems like they're in a holding pattern waiting for Yoshioka to come back. I, I guess for me, I, at least with this show, and I think that, it also goes back to kind of Kobe world. I, I, I feel like at least popularity pecking order, uh, Hyo and Daya have kind of flipped over the recent weeks. And I do kind of feel like that the momentum that Hyo kind of had or has had, like it just feels like that the, that not that he, that he was pulling back, but it feels like that Daya right now. And it might just be because you had, best of the super juniors where you say like hey he's back and he gets the brave gate against the popular guy right now but i i I do feel like that d courage is kind of a little adrift but with everything with dia kind of becoming more and and more relevant and 
and Tanaka, it does kind of feel like that it, we are kind of looking towards Yoshioka. And yeah, no, I, no, I mean, look, Daya helps. He, he feels like a bigger deal than Kakuta does, which is not what you want coming into Dangerous Gate. Yeah, Kakuta is... It, it, and it's like a wild thing with the promos with him and Yamato too, where like Yamato is kind of deferential to him after Kobe world, which I don't know if that that's what I would do with that. I don't know. It's a, it's a tough position to be in where you, you scheduled things the way that you did with dangerous gate being this early and Kobe being as late as it was. I, I you know, I, I look through the roster and it's like, you know, you don't want to do Yamato versus Mochizuki because that does seem counterintuitive to what you're doing with the Reiwa generation. I, I guess the story there is just built in that it's, hey, you know, it's Yamato versus a young guy. We've been talking about this for a year and a half now. Boom, here you go. Here's the match. I do wonder if they would have been better served, again, going with Kai, where there's a more built-in story there, or going with Shun and blowing the lid off of this rain very early on, or even going with KZ and revisiting the Yamato and KZ history because this is a this is a tough spot to be in. These guys have no history with each other. Their only real historical anecdote is they teamed together when Shingo came back at Final Gate. They've never had a singles match, and it's really hard to get excited for something that it is was sort of thrust into thin air. Yeah, it's and maybe it is the scenario that Kakuda is the person that at least out of the Reiwa generation can take that fall and it'll be okay because you're going to heat him up sometime down the line. Oh, yeah. I I mean, look, I I said this in 30 under 30. Don't worry about Kakuta. Does he need to deliver in that match? He absolutely does. But I'm not worried about him delivering, and I'm not worried about his long-term prospects. Again, you almost have to, to put this match in terms of the scope of Kakuta's career with an asterisk next to it because of everything I just said about D courage. This is not going to be the uh, character defining Madoka Kakuta Dreamgate challenge. Now it could be an amazing match and it could be a career defining match in terms of, of quality in terms of greatness, but it, this isn't peak Madoka Kakuta. This isn't the Kakuta that we're always going to remember. This is a fork in the road defense for Yamato. I'm sorry, not a fork in the road defense, but just, you know, a, a V one move on from here. Yamato defense as long as Kakuta brings in his half of the bargain, this doesn't matter towards Kakuta's trajectory or his career or his character. This match is far more about Yamato than it is Kakuta. Yep. No, I think that's entirely fair with that. Uh, elsewhere on this main event, uh, the gold class came out afterwards to set up the uh, all-out war with uh, uh, with Zebrats afterwards. I just, like... Tanaka and Ishin really the, the, might be the best chemistry on the roster at times, I feel like, with the finish, at least here. I could see that, yeah. I, I, at least that, that was kind of a little bit of a takeaway. I, I, I was three and a quarter on this. Uh, wh- where did you have the main three, event? Three and a half. All right, that's fair. That's fair. And what did you have on Minora versus Minorita? I had three and a quarter. All right. Uh, should, should we just work our way back down the card, or is there? It, Let's what, go to the semi main because I have a I have a big picture question for you. We can we can uh, work from main event on down. Absolutely. So w- we were talking about Yamato and Kakuda headlining Dangerous Gate. Yamato was in the semi main event of the Korkin show. Uh, big hug, Hio and Jackie Kame defeat Paradox Yamato and Susumu Yokosuka. Hio caught Susumu with the Samson driver for the win with Big Hug here. Uh, this was my match of the night. I mean, this was the one that I was just a shade away from going for on, but I thought that this really, I really enjoyed it. And I mean, it was a lot of it was Yamato with uh, Jackie Kame. I do get the impression that in the same way that I have a hunch that Ultimo really enjoys wrestling UT, just because of some of the treatment that UT has been given in a favorable way from Ultimo over the last few years, I do get the impression that Yamato really enjoys working with Jackie Kame. That is, I, I do you feel that same way. Oh yeah, it, it, it especially with the way that they are that that Kame sells like the chop battles and like that. Like it, it, it is something with Yamato. You kind of see a little bit of a twinkle in his eye. I yeah, very like. much so. What what was the? Uh, I sent you that article today. If you go to the Gaiora website, oh, Sky Perfect. Yeah, there's a big Sky Perfect interview with 
Yamato. And I'll read this. This is machine translation. Uh, I'm sure we're missing details and context here. But Sky Perfect asked Yamato uh, is sort of just about the, the context of wrestlers growing within Dragon Gate. And they say, for example, the organization is able to determine to some extent what a person's future will be when they join. And Yamato says, there's nothing in particular. For example, there's Jackie Kame. He was a gloomy character, but from the second half of last year to the first half of this year, he was definitely the central figure. In other organizations, the ring, which I'm assuming means the promotion, would never revolve around Kame. We didn't think he would go that far. There are a lot of people like that around now. Also, I think they're good at using the veterans so that they can make things easier for themselves, and then Yamato laughs. So he himself is saying that that Kame has already far exceeded expectations from where they thought he would be when he debuted. Yeah, it, it a real kind of fun interview, I feel like, from Yamato, because he's also talking about just, like, how old he is in about 10 years, because he apparently did an interview with him in 2014. 20- 14 as the almighty and it's just very much like we are at this time where yamato at this point is just going to just kind of shoot from the hip at this point well it's it's a it's a victory lap you know Mm -hmm. yamato yamato feels very confident it's it feels which is why i'm so into him right now and what he's doing and i'm into the idea of a boastful and proud yamato you know we did not get that in tribe vanguard we did not get that in team drangi we did not get that in high end even though we've seen babyface Dreamgate champion Yamato before, this is a new wrinkle on it. And it's one that, again, I would recommend, even with the machine translation, it seems to come out relatively clean. Checking mm-hmm. out that Sky Perfect interview. Yeah, especially considering the market of which Yamato felt like they should be targeting instead. Yes, very much so. Let me ask you a question about the semi main. Uh, are we voting Hyo for most improved this year? I feel like work rate wise. You kind of have to just because it, it would either be him or Tanaka, because if you're talking about where they were at, at least at the start of the year and where they are now, I feel like Hio uh, always it, I, I would say by about 2021, you wouldn't get very many bad Hio matches, but there wouldn't necessarily be exceptional ones. But I would say that he's done his best in worrying work. Uh, at least in Big Hug, I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pa- Paul in the Discord mentioned that today in the Observer Awards section, and I obviously, I, I have spent zero time thinking about that, but I read that today and I thought, well, I, 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 can't, th- I can't think of anybody else off the bat. Now, granted, I'm super behind on the G1. I'm actually watching it as we speak, and maybe if one of the, the young, uh, quote-unquote, New Japan stars really blows me away. You know, if I like what Yu Amora is doing at the tournament, then okay, maybe I can see that argument there. But Hyo, Hyo feels like the right answer this year because it, it's a little it's a little Tokyo sports-ish where there, there's got to be an award to give a Dragon Gate guy. You just don't know what it is. And Hyo feels right for most improved this year. Like, you have to recognize Hyo's year with some sort of award. And most improved I, it seems to fit more than anything else. Yeah, if I'm thinking 2024, maybe Queen Aminata is the... Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I feel like she would be a strong other candidate. Uh, yeah, I don't know New Japan-wise. I, 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 because I think what, Yuya Uemura would be that, but I just, like, his style doesn't necessarily excite me, even though he's very good at it, you know? Or he's gotten I, well, better I'm, at it. I mean, look, it's enjoyable watching him wrestle to Kestra, the... Uh... Mm-hmm. The test for me and him will be when he's not wrestling to Kesha, but I, I have not gotten that far in the G1 yet. I'm I'm picking and choosing, and I'm on day four as we speak, <laughs> and only watching this match from day four because I don't have it in me to watch David Finley versus Hanare or El Fantasmo, who I like more than most, versus Yotasuji. That's just not happening. Yeah. Uh, El Fantasmo in this tournament, yeah. No good? I just don't have a use for him. Okay. I... It it does it does feel like I uh, I really liked him at one point and I'm I'm okay with selling my stock. Uh, I'll check out a few of his matches, but I don't know. I, I I I shouldn't be like this because I get annoyed when people that only parachute into watch Dragon Gate are like, I don't know, these just aren't the guys that I grew up with because that's a that's lazy analysis. But I'm looking at some of these G1 lineups and I'm thinking like. 
man, these aren't, this isn't my G1, no Ishii, no Okada. I just, I don't know about this. Yeah, I guess like for me and the G1, it, it, it's just like, if I wanted to watch like a 20 person tournament of very good matches, I would probably go and do that. But if I'm watching the G1, I expect it to be the G1 climax. Yes. And that's what's missing. Okay, good to know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't know. I'm looking at some of these cards. They don't they don't excite me. But I, I heard today's Corkin show was great. There's some Shingo stuff I want to check out. And, uh, you know, I think we've all kind of accepted the position that I've long held, which is that Tetsuya Naito was not a very good pro wrestler. <laughs> I, I mean, he's uh, th- th- this will surprise you. But the story of the tournament is that can Naito hit the Destino? God, that really sounds terrible. I don't know. It's it's, it's always my thing with Naito. It's just like, even at his peak, even when he had all those Kenny Omega matches and he had all those Ibushi matches and he had those Okada matches, I, I've never left a, a great Naito match going, God, Naito was great in that match. It's always it's always the other guy. And Naito's there. No, no. Uh, I mean, I think about sense. Uh, it, it, it's not that like he had like an insane match with uh, with Suji, you know? Yeah. Like, lo, lo, like this is the time he should be having those kinds of. Very much so. Very much so. Okay, I think I'm voting Kyo most improved this year, and uh, that's all I have to say on that match. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it was very good. I went three and a half on it. It was fun. I, I thought it was a whole lot of fun, and I think more the more Yamato and Jackie Kame we can get, the better. Uh, working our way back, we had uh, Luis Monte defeat Big Boss Shimizu in his N one victory. Uh, send off match. It was a battle of heavyweights. Win with a desperation super tigre Rana hold. Uh, after the match, and this was the go to intermission match. Uh, Rio Saito brought out Hamare Kato, announced that his debut will be on the September 5th Corican, and there was a Hamare chant that broke out. And then afterwards, uh, other the two other uh members, Kat, uh, so Kato Sahara. And I, I, I do not have the tweet with the other one. The only one who did who did not pass their test immediately was Oshima, right? Yes, that is correct. I don't see I don't see the tweet with the three of them now, because yeah, there should be four, but I think yeah, I think one of them was was late to join. Did we get official word that one of the four failed their test and is is done? No, I, I thought I saw someone tweet a a Rio Saito with three of them. I thought I did too. Um, Let me look through the discord because I I know what you're talking about. Um, Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because Oshima was the one that was left out. I know that. That was an older. Okay. That was an older tweet. Um, That tweet was from October and Oshima started working future matches in the spring. So he might have joined later than the rest of those kids. Yeah. He might not be up for it. Yeah. Yeah, Sahara is the one that I like. Sahara is the the giant one, ninety kilograms. That's what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Kato super he- handsome. I'm I'm looking forward to that. Look, I, you know, you know me. I love a I love a good rookie. But I'm I'm waiting for Akira, uh, a a a Akihiro Sahara from Kobe, ninety kilograms to debut. That's gonna be my guy. Yeah, Sahara is the big one. Sujiguchi was the one I was leaving out. Yeah, I have not seen Sujiguchi in a while though. I think Sujiguchi uh, was Max Z during like the fake Max Z character. He was, yes. Yeah, but uh, Hamare, I, I, I feel like at least other than you know Kato uh, defeating people in exhibition matches, Hamare getting that response was probably one of the louder uh, rookie announcements in a long time. I agree. I, I like the way they did it. You know, uh, not positioning it before the show, but. Uh, after a hot match, a match that I liked way more than you, which we'll talk about here momentarily, it was just a nice little moment. You know, I'm I'm already rooting for the kid. It's amazing how that works. Yeah. Uh, so I was three and a quarter on this. I thought this was a fun pre and intermission car wreck. Uh, where were you at? And sell me on it being better, much better than it, what I thought it was. Yeah, it was a four. I mean, I thought this match really? was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, but it was also, I think perhaps I fell in love with the idea of the match as much as I did the match itself because... I'm watching Monte get his ass kicked by, you know, Drangate's most active heavyweight in preparation for the N1. And I'm just like, yeah, this is a this is a great booking. This is good stuff. This is exactly what they should have done. It makes Monte look tough to the Drangate audience. It makes Monte look tough to the Noah audience. And by the goddamn way, I, 
I, I have no new talking point on this other than my God is Shimizu underrated. I, I, any promotion in the world should kill to get this guy on their roster. Yeah, I, I, I think for me it was the the fact that it felt like the send off match that I couldn't get past it, but it was fun. I mean, the fact that they they were basically playing off who can get the power bomb and they were countering their way out of it. Uh, the, the, I, it, it is a wild thing that like we are so far beyond this that when Jay and Hoho brought up uh, Bokudomo Dragon, I was like, oh yeah, that was definitely a mask feud that went on. Yeah, <laughs> you're exactly right. I mean, what they've done with Shimizu is just, it's so impressive. And I and I think, like, I know last year going into the Gate of Destiny, and even the year before that, going into Champion Gate, when he wrestled Kai for the Dream Gate, and then obviously last year, Kakuta. I, I'm sure during the previews to both matches, I was like, well, this is going to be the peak of Shimizu. You know, this will be his last Dream Gate match. And I watched him here and just thought, Man, this guy should have a three month Dreamgate run. Like, this guy's actually too good to go his entire career without holding the Dreamgate championship. And I don't know what context it would ever make sense to get him uh, the Dreamgate belt, but my God, is this guy good. He is just such a special wrestler. Yeah. And I, I feel like where he is now, and I, I, I feel like it's not even like a statement on vibes, but right now, the the fact that you could put Shimizu in a special singles match with like half of the roster, I'm like, okay, let's yeah. see what's gonna happen there. Like uh Big Boss Shimizu versus Daiki Yanaguchi. I'm, I'm into, into it. it. Yep, I'm yeah. into it. There's yeah. a million I, things you can do with him. You know, I thought I thought last year his match with Shun was so so good. Cause it was kind of two guys going out there that that are oftentimes we know how great they are, but they're in a position where they can't fully show how great they are. And then you put them in a singles match and you go, Oh, that's right. That's right. This is, this is how they are. And Shimizu in particular is in such an interesting spot because he's got, he's got no one to turn to, you know, his closest generational peer at this point is UT. You know, he would have been in that generation with T-Hawk and with Ata and with Hayashi, uh, Lindemann, not, not Yuga Hayashi, good Lord, L Lindemann, and they're all gone. You know, he's he has no real contemporaries outside of UT, and you see them team, but it's not like they'll ever have a great generational rivalry. And that was what they, you know, the story they told going into November of last year with the with the Dreamgate match. And I, I, I just, I, I think there's a, a real argument to be made that Shimizu deserves a little bit more than what he's got now. Yeah, and especially given the fact that the focus has gone on to like the not that he has been skipped but like the the that like Rewa 6 and being able to have all those rivalries that's going to be kind of the bread and butter in theory of the promotion in the next 5 to 10 he still i mean Shimizu is not even that 36 i think he's not that old that like that is the surprising thing to me is that it, it, he's in kind of like this adrift thing. So he is 31. Big Boss oh is only 31. Yeah. I, I knew he was a lot younger than we thought. And I think that's also the issue with like the generational peers, because even though it would be like your Lindemann and your T Hawks and your Atas, in, in a weird way, he feels like he is younger than them. But he is. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. But and I feel like that is a scenario where it, it, he kind of like the the fact that he doesn't have a generational peer that the fact that he is a heavyweight makes up for it in some ways because you can have matches like this Luis Monte match and it feels like it has a bit more heft to it whereas if he was you know I I mean he he's he's announced and listed at, at basically 110 kilos if he was announced at like 80 or 90 kilos i don't think that it works that way for him i think the fact that he's like true heavyweight it, it provides him just a little bit of a way to get over the lack of generational peers i know the timeline doesn't entirely match up but you do have to wonder if in 2017 they try to make something of shimizu as a heel instead of that second t-hawk run that didn't go anywhere and just how things would be different because 
2016 King of Gate, it comes down to Yamato and Shimizu, which is one of my favorite Yamato matches, and it's one of my favorite Shimizu matches. And 2016, I thought Shimizu was a top 10 wrestler in the world, and 2016 was a glorious year of pro wrestling, and I thought Shimizu was right up there with just about everybody else. And if you turn him heel and do Yamato and Shimizu a world a year after that King of Gate finals, I think that's a really interesting scenario. No, I'm... I, it... it it's interesting with him and I feel like that him being kind of this address figure kind of makes him interesting in that level because oh, yeah oh my god I mean if he you know I I, I didn't really do this with Yamato because he's he's won six stream gate belts but I, I've I found myself ever since the Ata title win I really like doing basically an article within my written review whenever there's a new Dreamgate champion and telling the story of their career and if Shimizu were ever to win a Dreamgate belt, what a fascinating career. That guy has a story to tell. I, I really, I really hope it happens one day. And I, I, I don't know the context of it, when it would make sense, whether he'd be a face or a heel, what it would be. But man, I'd really like to see that. And I feel like in a way, if he does it, he kind of, in a, it, it, go with me on this. He has that Tozawa kind of role of finally reaching it, that he gets there before KZ. Oh, that's fantastic. God, I want to see Shimizu and KZ in a singles match. Yeah, that would be a great King of Gate match coming up. Oh, man. All right. All right. Let's rock and roll. What's next? So working our way back, Case, this is when we got to talk about uh, Jiro as uh, Aganisu versus Parados, Misaki, Mochizuki, Toro Washi, Suji Kondo, defeat Dragon Cave, uh, Naruki Doi, and Kagatora. Kondo reverses a doyable to pin uh, his biggest rival from the Torimon era, Dragon Kid, that gives him the immediate claim for a Twin Gate match. You, you would think, oh, Awashi and Kondo, that would be a great Twin Gate match. Or even Kondo and Mochizuki, that sounds great for Yokohama. Instead, we get uh, his former Wrestle 1 uh, uh, compatriot, uh, Kurshiro Tokyo, Japan, who has always wanted to make an appearance in Dragon Gate, but he will be the other challenger for Not Hug in Yokohama. So Naruki Doi and Dragon Kid making their defense against Shuji Kondo and Kurshiro Tokyo, Japan. Well, historically, and I note historically, I feel like I've been a little kinder to Jiro than others have. That being said, I have no interest in seeing him in this environment. No, and you lose the fact that they're not going to pay for his theme music and they're going to mute it, so you don't even have like the crowd get laughing at him getting out of the ring during his entrance. So you're kind of like left with why? What? Why do you bring? Why do you like bring him in? And the idea is, I guess maybe he sell some tickets i don't i don't see that he's like that big of a name to actually bring like bring people in for it like that's the weird thing is like it's just like oh i mean you you could have gone in a lot of different ways with condo that would have been much more interesting than this yeah yeah because i you know look net positive toro washi he's been there all year i i would have been very open to seeing an old guy's twin gate match the, the Jiro thing is tough because when Stronghearts came into Wrestle 1, they were often opposite him, and I thought he did really well there. It's, it's far and away the most I've ever enjoyed him. And this was around the time, and Mike, I'm sure you remember this, where we'd get these tweets of like, Tokyo Sports Fan Poll, who are the most popular 10 wrestlers in Japan? And it's Okada, Tanahashi, Ibushi. And then number 10 would be Jiro, and we'd all go like, wait, what the, what the fuck is this? And so it felt like for a minute there, there was real momentum where like, I wanted to see, I wanted to see Shima versus Jiro and they did T-Hawk versus Jiro and it was pretty good. And I thought like, oh, well, if he exists as like the permanent baby face against Stronghearts, that's a pretty interesting dichotomy there. I like that. The problem is that it's five years later, by all accounts, he's more annoying. Very, very rarely do I make the choice to watch him because he's in all Japan and I, I don't watch full all Japan shows. And he's in there with three guys that I really like. And I feel like if it was anybody else in his spot, this match would be a million times better and way more exciting on paper. Yeah. Uh, I, I think like those uh, Tokyo sports polls, 
he did a lot of crossover media at one point. Like, yeah, that's always been the vibe is that the guy works his ass off and right. he's, he's, uh, perhaps more recognizable than he is famous, if that makes sense. No, yeah, absolutely. I just like, since he's returned from WWE, and I mean, like, he's he's made a lot of, of great appearances. He's basically been him and Sego Tachibana have been tied, have been attached to the hip since he's come back. I just like, I maybe he saw seconds. Like, that's the only like justification for like how annoying the match is going to be now that I can justify it for. Because yeah, I'd rather have net positive Toro Washi here. I I mean, I don't need. Takuya Sugawara in my Dragon Gate, but uh, could have done that too. I would have taken Yashi here because at least the dynamic of Kondo oh, and Yashi in Yo, Doi yeah. and Dragon Kid, that's, a, that's at least an interesting match. It might not be good, but it'd be interesting. That That's almost a T2P match. Exactly. Yeah. yeah there's, I, I just like the way those names line up on paper because that's, you know, a, a guys that have been around each other for 25 years but have never wrestled that exact match before, at least that I remember. Yeah, and, and then you get like Itakon. Like you have a lot of different things here, but yeah, I I guess also, I I look at the rest of Dangerous Gate, and I maybe with how things are kind of positioned on the card, it's like okay, he's not going to be like teaming with uh, uh, Masaki Mochizuki and Don Fuji versus the Kung Fu Masters. You know, like there's not a lot of other spots to really make it work and unless you're like promoting a washi straight up and just doing a one for one split or, or or switch it's that you don't necessarily have anything i i, I guess super strong to put in there for his place i guess yeah yeah i, I don't know it's a it's a tough one because i know in our bubble it's only going to retract people it's it, you know no one's going oh my god jiro's on the dragon gate show man dragon gate must be cooking right now uh i, I think it's going to lead to uh, a lot of takes that maybe aren't necessarily fair to the state of Dragon Gate mm-hmm. uh, and, and maybe label uh, some label of desperation on them that I don't think is entirely accurate. And it also is just going to take down the match because I think Kondo has been very good this year. Uh, we, we've done the Doi Dragon Kid conversation, but they're going to have they're going to have an anchor, you know, in that match. And it, it'll be a real testament to all involved if it ends up being something worthwhile. No, I'm with you on that uh, before that, we had uh, Kota Minora versus Minorita. We didn't actually talk a lot about the match itself. So, I, well, I, I mean, Minorita is an excellent pro wrestler. And yeah. I really wasn't sure if he was going to be able to get that back post the injury he had. But you watch Minorita now, you would have no idea that he was out injured for a year with a leg injury. And I mean, like, starts off with his corkscrew tornado dive and all of that like he it's not just that he's like wrestled his way back into shape it's just like this match like we got to see like oh yeah no the person who studies menorah intently to imitate him understands his offense we got to have that i got a little tired of the golden rose hunting at a certain point it did kind of at a certain point feel like kind menorah was like well i'm going for the golden rose and that's what i'm doing here and that's been an issue sometimes with his matches with me and I, I can see that. I, I feel like it was it was so intentional in this match that I was happy to ride the wave more so than fight against it. Yeah, and they made it a real that Rita made him work for it. He was able to turn one of the Golden Roses kind of into a headlock takeover, but not like the big one. And then it, eventually it took the jumping knee R301 and then the Golden Rose to win. But I, I, I feel like that they did enough here to do the match and then leave a lot left in the tank. Absolutely. No, it was it was fun. It was it was constructed like a really good TV match. Yep, that's entirely fair. And then match to uh, Tori Mancasa, Ultimo Dragon, La Estrella, and Junta Miyawaki from Pro Wrestling Noah. Defeat Punch Nomonaga, uh, Don Fuji, and Daiki Yanagiuchi. And this is where Junta made his Brave Gate challenge afterwards. But uh, what what do you think of the lovely work we got between Junta and Punch Nomonaga? Okay, so it's it's easy to analyze Junta's performance here because there were two different things happening. Anytime he was in the ring with Punch, it was very bad. Otherwise, it was fine. You know, I think he and Daya are going to have a very competent three and a quarter star Bravegate match. We're going to move on from it 
It'll be forgettable. Three years from now, we'll go, oh, remember when Junto worked a Brave Gate match? That was weird. Oh, and then Jiro stuck up the joint of the Twin Gate match? Oh, what a disappointment. We'll have that conversation three years from now. The chemistry with Punch was bad, but Punch has bad chemistry with a lot of different people. So I, I can't put that all on Junta. And I thought otherwise he looked fine. Yeah, uh, I did think he did like a pretty gnarly shoulder breaker that looked pretty good. Like, I, I, I think that it will be a perfectly competent match here. It, it, it the, the, the biggest issue we're going to have three years from now is that we'll be doing like five star match game with Joe Gagne. We'll have us like name Dreamgate cha- or or Brave Gate challengers, and we're not going to remember the Brave Gate challenger from Dangerous Gate 2024. Yeah, that's a tough one. That that's absolutely a tough one. And then we opened with Natural Vibes defeating Gold Class, uh, Strong Machine J, KZ, and UT uh, versus Benk, uh, BB Hulk, and Mochizuki Junior. UT getting the Fuego. Uh, which is a crucifix driver on Mochizuki Jr. for the win. Kicked ass. Loved this. Loved this opener. Yeah, uh, SMJ and Jr. just rocking it. Eventually, one day, one of them is going to have to be the better second generation wrestler, and we're going to, and they're just going to try to murder each other until they decide that. You're not on this panel, so you won't have to deal with it, but I'm already anticipating very hostile and passive aggressive emails and the Fighting Spirit 50 email thread that we're on when I advocate for Junior to be a top 25 wrestler this year and people that are actively against Dragon Gate being represented in the poll are not going to take very kindly to it. But I don't know. I feel like Junior just on a on a show-in, show-out basis is better than uh, the overwhelming majority of pro wrestlers right now. Yeah, and I love how... It was this consumption of the feud with him and Strong Machine J that left his back open for UT, and that was really cool. It's like, oh, this is these are the things that make me love UT because it's like, oh, you you are just obsessed with going after Strong Machine J. That's okay. I'm gonna go for Hikari Noah on you right now, and I really enjoyed that. Yeah, now I want to see UT and, and J in a singles match. Or, I'm sorry, UT and Junior in a singles match. Oh, absolutely. I feel like those two have some pretty special chemistry there if, if they're given the opportunity. And, yeah, uh, I really into, like, th- this is kind of the rematch from uh, Kobe World, at least. I mean, it, it, but I I really thought this was a fun opener. and I'm And, and I would like to see more of this or, or a more of gold class versus natural vibes because or at least this pairing because really it's felt like that they have a lot of chemistry that they could work with yeah i would assume and and we can transition into a into a dangerous gate preview here as i have about 10 minutes before i have to go so we'll, yep, we'll have just enough it. time but i would assume we're we're going to get junior and jay attached at the hip for the rest of the year i mean that that doesn't feel done by any means no, and I feel like at least with where they are right now and the way that, you know, Junior has basically been kind of been betrayed by the other second generation wrestlers and by a lot of other wrestlers, like you can go to this well. This is a well that like they should be the this should be the generational peer for Mochizuki Junior, I feel like. Oh, very much so. Very much so. So we talked about a bunch of this card. It is on Monday, uh, Yokohama Budokan National Holiday for Japan. Eight matches on the card. Uh, we've already kind of talked about the main event, but Yamato versus Madoka Kakuda. I think both of us are pretty heavily towards Yamato just key collecting here. Yes. No, this is this is V1. This is Yamato getting a win. Uh, the result is not in question. It's really only a matter of of how good this match is. And and for the sake of Kakuta, you know, you hope he comes out there and kills it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see who works uh, more dominant in this match. I would mm-hmm. hope, I would hope, given the way that Yamato has been speaking and presenting himself since he won the title, that this is a dominant Kakuta performance with Yamato fighting from underneath. To me, that is far more interesting than Yamato beating up the young guy and having Kakuta make a comeback and then lose in the end. Yeah, and I think at the very least, like the one kind of plot point that Yamato has made is that Kakuta is the one of the Reiwa generation that he really wanted to face. 
that he's the one that he feels like that presents him a a real battle because he's never faced Kakuda before. Because Kakuda's first real singles match was the Dreamgate match they got injured in. <laughs> so, so like that, that you have a little bit of that that I think it makes this match pretty intriguing, but that's more of the match itself than actually the result. Yeah, it's very similar to the Ben build where you know, the 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 sell on Kobe World was, hey, Yamato's been talking about this for a year now. Like, there's there's a built-in story here, even if there's not a ton that Yamato and Ben can do themselves to elevate this match. And Yamato Kokucha's the same way. It's, it's the same story as the Ben match, just with a different guy uh, challenging for the belt. Uh, semi-main event, uh, open the Triangle Gate Championship match. We actually didn't have a whole lot on the Cork and Show previewing this but it's champion team natural vibes smj ut and shimizu uh defending against luis monte in from the n1 victory hyo and jackie kame when this match was made we felt like that now this is kind of where you put goal where you put big hug and it feels pretty good for them there uh i'm still thinking that this could be a pretty tough defense for natural vibes uh where are you coming down on that i hate to flip-flop on some some opinions that I've stated pretty boldly in the past, but I like this vibes team so much that I'd be very very interested in them keeping the belts. I, I the the runway here, the red carpet is there for Big Hug to kill him, get the belts, have the run, whatever. But if Vibes wins, I will not be upset. Yeah, I, I I'm still waiting to see how Chapter Four Vibes is much different from from KZ era vibes. And in order to see that, I guess that their main triangle gate champion. It would be very fun if that was the long-term story there was if Jay challenged KZ's and the the original natural vibes trios triangle gate defense record. Would they go then KZ, Ginky Horiguchi, Susumi Yokosuka as a challenger to stop that? I don't think Genki has that left in him. <sighs> I that know. would be fun, though. It That'd would be, be fun. fun. It would be fun. You, I look. I, I love. I love a good unit callback. That's fine with me. I don't think Genki has the body to do that anymore. Worth noting, we are going to be in Kunamoto coming up for Genki. Uh, uh, the, the Kunamoto show last year in October was one of the best shows they had all year. That was a very fun show. I think the November one is the network one this year. Okay, good. Because he's doing like a was... series of Kunamoto shows. Like they're calling it the uh, Ginky Horiguchi Super Fight Series 2024. I love that. Good for him. Yeah, that <laughs> that Kunamoto show last year that made the network, I remember, yeah, Sunday, November 17th. That looks like that's when they'll do that. Right. Uh, that show last year felt like the way that American TV wrestling should feel every single week. That was a compact and concise show that had a million things going on and everything was super exciting. Yeah. And, uh, it, 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 and with the fact that they're kind of making this into a big thing, it does make me kind of have my antenna up with him that this could be a really special one coming up in November. It's true. That's a good point. Uh, the Twin Gate match that we talked about before, not hugged, defending against Kondo and and Jiro. Uh, Minorita contra Mini Skywalker, Gold Class versus Zebrats, all out war. Minora, Benke, BB Hulk, Mochizuki Jr. versus Sh- Shun Skywalker, Kai, Ishin, and Jason Lee. I guess this is what we kind of got to decide uh, who's going to get uh, possession of, of uh, Tumi Hayakawa. Well, I have to apologize here because an hour ago I hinted at Junior turning heel and then I never got back to it. And yeah. The argument for junior, junior turning heel is that this is what's happened to him in all of his previous friendships, whether it was Ishin or whether it was Kato, is that they seem to join up with him and then they wrestle Zebrats on a big show and they turn and join Zebrats. And I guess the argument there is maybe Minora saves Minorita Gold class thinks they have peace and then junior turns heel. Do I think it's likely? No. Do I want it to happen? No. Can I rule it out? Also, no. I like that as a 1% chance. I know, you know? right? It's something worth mentioning. Yep. Uh, Brave Gate is before that. Uh, Daya, Junta, Miyawaki. Uh, and then we get to our three undercard matches. 
couple of interesting ones here. We talked about KZ and Rio Yatsunaka. That's opening the show. But match three, uh, Paradox, original Jimmy's, Susumi Yokosuka and Kagatora versus, versus uh, Yazushi Kanda and La Estrella. I'm into this a lot, actually, the more I look at it. Well, yeah, I mean, Susumu can make us buy into La Estrella again. Now, I'm I'm higher on Estrella than most. I think he actually has a place on the card. His presence does not bother me whatsoever. So, yeah, no, this this is one of those that could end up being, if it if it has eight minutes instead of four minutes, it could end up being a really, really fun match. Yeah, really. I mean, like, I'm hoping for a fun eight-minute sprint. And the four minutes can go to Masaki Mochizuki, Don Fuji, Toro Washi versus Ho-Ho Lun, uh, and then the other, uh, Hori and Reach Tomonaga, the new Kung Fu Masters. Yeah, I'm good on that one. And then KZ and Ryoya Tanaka open up Dangerous Gate 2024 for us. Again, that is this Monday. It's a national holiday in Japan. Uh, the start time is 4 o'clock local in Yokohama. That is on the 12th. And we'll be back with you next week to talk all about it. Case, anything else you want to touch on before we got out of here? I don't think so. I, I, it should be It should be a good show. You know, I don't think it's going to be a great show. I don't think it's possible for it to be a great show. It should be a very good show. So uh, we will have a quick turnaround there, and we'll talk about that next Tuesday. Yep, it sounds good. Yeah, I'm uh, m- my one hope from this, from Gate of Bayside, I want them to turn off the house lights. That's my one hope for the show. But uh, yeah, uh, the turnaround, I feel like, did a little bit to it. I mean, we talked about Yamato and, and Kakuda not necessarily having a lot of tooth to it, but I, I, I'm really into the gold class versus Zebrats uh, angle coming out of that. So I have some pretty high hopes for that. Yeah, but a- as am I. That That is, I think, for people like you and I, I think that's the main draw on this show. Absolutely. And as you said, we will be back next week, next Tuesday, to talk all about it. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. Cases at underscore in your case. I'm at Fujiheya. Thanks for listening to Open Voice Gate. We'll be back with you next week. Take care. That's the sound of your current hype level at the gas pump. But brace yourself for something fuel nominal, because Unleaded 88 is about to take the hype to a whole new level. Unleaded 88 is cheaper, cleaner, and greener than regular Unleaded. Plus, it's homegrown, making Unleaded 88 the clear choice at the pump and totally worth the hype. So pump it up with Unleaded 88, brought to you by Iowa Corn. Save big at Menards. Discovering the perfect paint for your home has never been easier with Zinsser Smart Coat. Plan smart with interactive tools at smartcoat.com. Buy smart in store or online for home delivery. And paint smart with this advanced paint and primer in one. Save big on Zinsser Smart Coat at Menards. America's number one home improvement retailer for customer satisfaction, according to JD Power. For JD Power 2024 award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards. Save big. Hello, do you like New Japan Pro Wrestling? Are you a Shin Nihon freak? If so, check out the Super J-Cast with Joel and Damon on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And even if you fucking hate New Japan Pro Wrestling, listen to the Super J-Cast anyway. Not just for our great show reviews, analysis, and pastrami sandwiches, mm -hmm. but there's also usually some dick jokes somewhere in the obligatory opening 30 minutes of absolute nonsense we chat about every single week. That's the Super J-Cast for all the best talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling, crisps, and pornography.